Big news. Thank you. Trump's new general chief of staff has big surprise he's bringing to work with him to shake things up. As everyone knows by now President Donald Trump abruptly announced Thursday night that he has appointed Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly to be his new chief of staff. In effect finally putting an end the six-month fiasco which was having the swamp leader Reince Priebus in that same position. Priebus is the former Republican National Committee chairman which effectively makes him the leader of the very swamp that Trump campaigned against Priebus told allies that he had offered his resignation to Trump on Thursday. Good riddance. Although many of us who supported Trump since day one couldn't believe it when he appointed Priebus, after many months of speculation President Trump tweeted his decision to fire him just as he landed in Washington after a speech which he gave in New York where he praised Kelly's performance as Homeland Security Director. He later added that Reince Priebus is a good man and that John Kelly will do a fantastic job as Chief of Staff. I think we can all agree on the Kelly part. John Kelly is a retired Marine Force Tar General. Insider sources reveal that Trump had been mentioning him in recent days. He even went as far as telling those close to him that he believed military discipline was what his administration needed. Time reports, John Kelly, Donald Trump's star secretary, is now White House Chief of Staff, Washington, retired Marine General John Kelly may need to find and strap on some armor. The battle hardened, outspoken commander's new mission is to study the roiling Trump administration and quiet the friendly fire, as White House Chief of Staff. He has been a true star of my administration, the President tweeted Friday, announcing that his current Secretary of Homeland Security was in, and White House Chief of Staff Reince Priebus was out. Trump called Kelly a great leader and great American. He called Priebus a good man. If loyalty is indeed what Trump wants, he gets in Kelly. He also gets a veteran of three tours in Iraq and a survivor of a family tragedy. As Homeland Security Secretary, Kelly has taken the lead on some of Trump's most controversial policies, including his executive order suspending the admission of refugees and temporarily barring visitors from several Muslim-majority nations. Those orders have been stripped down by courts pending a Supreme Court review this fall. People who know Kelly told the Associated Press that he was not aware of the details of the initial orders until around the time that Trump signed it. Yet, just days after taking office, he had to leave the agency as it dealt with the chaos and confusion that ensued at airports in the U.S. and around the world. He defended the orders to reporters and lawmakers and insisted he indeed had been part of the decision-making process. Since joining the Marine Corps in 1970, Kelly carved out the reputation as a highly respected, but often outspoken commander who could royal debate and issue unpopular directives on issues ranging from women in combat to the treatment of detainees at the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. But the man chosen by Trump to lead his sniping administration holds a more somber distinction. Kelly is the highest-ranking officer to lose a child in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan. Kelly's son, Marine First Lieutenant Robert Kelly was killed in November 2010 in Afghanistan. That status, as part of what the military calls a gold star family, puts him in the administration of a presidential candidate who verbally attacked a gold star family, the Khans, Muslim American immigrants who lost a son in Iraq and had criticized Trump at the Democratic National Convention. Kelly retired this year, wrapping up a three-year post as head of U.S. Southern Command which spent some of the more fractious debate over the Obama administration's ultimately failed attempt to close Guantanamo. Kelly was the fifth person to lead the Department of Homeland Security, which includes agencies that protect the president, respond to disasters, enforce immigration laws, protect the nation's coastlines and secure air travel. His selection as secretary of the agency bolstered concerns about an increase in military influence in a Trump White House. In his final Pentagon News conference, Kelly spoke about the loss of his son, a topic he didn't often discuss publicly. To lose a child is, I can't imagine anything worse than that. I used to think, when I'd go to all of my trips up to Bethesda, Walter Reed, I'll go to the funerals with the secretaries of defense, that I could somehow imagine what it would be like, Kelly said. But, he added, when you lose one in combat, there's a in my opinion, 
there's a pride that goes with it, that he didn't have to be there doing what he was doing. He wanted to be there. He volunteered. Kelly said he gets occasional letters from Gold Star families who are asking, was it worth it? And I always go back with this, it doesn't matter. That's not our question to ask as parents. That young person thought it was worth it, and that's the only opinion that counts. Sadly Priebus, who has a reputation of being weak within Republican circles, could never bring an order to the team of rivals that make up Trump's West Wing. Questions about his future had been whispered around the office. Those questions sharply escalated this week with the appointment of Anthony Scaramucci to communications director, who was hired even though Priebus had serious objections about it. Let's hope and pray President Trump is right and John Kelly can clean up the mess that the swamp is trying to make his presidency. One thing is for certain, I think we can all agree that if anyone can clean up that mess, it's a Marine. Please share if you support the appointment of John Kelly to Chief of Staff. Michelle just told everyone why she's better than Melania, gets wrecked before she's finished. While the incessant left tries to convince everyone that conservatives are doing all of the comparing of the former first lady and the current, it's Michelle Obama who actually does this the most to glorify herself. Both Michelle and Barack Obama have had a tremendous struggle relinquishing control to the Trumps since they replaced them in the White House. The obsessed bear has trolled Donald and Melania around the globe showing up in their shadow and trying to reclaim the power position they lost six months ago. Michelle's motives with nipping at Melania's heels are slightly different than her husband's. She's badly missing the glow of the spotlight and is constantly chasing it now so she can keep telling people how great she is. She showed up hours ahead of President Trump's big announcement about banning transgenders in the military yesterday with an unrelated but backhanded message about why she's better than Melania but got wrecked before she finished delivering it. Michelle made her motives known that she had no intentions of slipping out of sight, right after Donald Trump's inauguration. She promised on multiple occasions since then that she's still going to be there for us and for America. She's unfortunately proved that she meant that, Mostly because she's so arrogant that she truly believes the people of our nation need her and she just stated why when she showed up at the Women's Foundation of Colorado's, WFCO, in Denver this week just hours before President Trump took to Twitter to make his monumental announcement about policy change in the military. Vanity Fair had a different reaction to what Michelle had to say that day, praising her for her bravery and what she's been through, glorifying her as an American hero. As she has promised several times in the months since the inauguration, Michelle Obama is still here for us, America, and with a knack for showing back up just when we need her most. Hours before Donald Trump announced via Twitter that the military would be rolling back efforts toward inclusivity that even the GOP Congress supported, Obama appeared at the Women's Foundation of Colorado's, WFCO and managed to use her own experiences with racism as a way to prove that America is still a good place. Really? Per the Denver Post, WFCO President and CEO Lauren Casty asked Obama which shards cut the deepest when she broke through the ceiling to become the first black first lady. Obama had an answer straight away. The shards that cut me the deepest were the ones that intended to cut, she said. Knowing that after eight years of working really hard for this country, there are still people who won't see me for what I am because of my skin color. With the floor and liberals' attention fawning over her every word and giving credence to her complaints, Michelle droned on about what she had to endure as the First Lady. Her remarks seemed to not only be for sympathy and attention but came across as a way to say that this racist-based persecution was not something Melania will ever have to face since she's white. This is wrong since Melania has had more than her fair share of attacks as an immigrant woman and former model, both reason liberals make fun of her for. Women, we endure those cuts in so many ways that we don't even notice we're cut, Michelle continued in her speech. We are living with small tiny cuts, and we are bleeding every single day. And we're still getting up. The people in this country are universally good and kind and honest and decent. Michelle added at the conclusion of her remarks. Don't be afraid of the country you live in. The folks here are good. Remember during the campaign when Obama vowed when they go low, we go high? 
she's still doing it, and remaining optimistic despite the massive task in front of her, and all of us, Vanity Fair reported. Michelle made the assumption in her speech that people are afraid of the country we live in today under Trump, by acting as the self-imposed voice of reason for them to not be since there are role models like her they can look up to. Whether people are really afraid, it's only because of the rhetoric she and her husband have pushed to perpetuate that nonsensical fear. The fact of the matter is that America is better than it has been in eight years with Trump in charge who has done a fast-tracked job of cleaning of the mess the Obamas left behind. Liberals in full meltdown after Trump announces his badass plan for dealing with arrested criminals. All the shiny new officers at Long Island Community College were in for the thrill of a lifetime on Friday when the president came and spoke to them about their jobs in law enforcement. His speech was no doubt thrilling for these officers because he's the president, but he also went out of his way to empower those officers to protect the people in their community from lawbreakers. His remarks were, of course, offensive to many because, well we are not supposed to tell liberals that they can't break the law. Mother Jones gleefully reported on the comments that they thought were totally out of line. President Donald Trump gave a speech at a Long Island Community College on Friday during which he encouraged the use of violence. Turns out the audience was comprised of officers in a police department that has been scrutinized for racial profiling and whose former chief was recently sentenced to prison for beating a man. The Suffolk County Police Department, SCPD, has been under federal oversight by the U.S. Department of Justice since 2013, following a two-year investigation into allegations of discrimination against Latinos and immigrants. Nearly 20 percent of the county's 1.5 million residents are Latino. During his speech, Trump encouraged officers not to be too nice to suspects or take measures to protect them from harm. The speech was supposed to address federal efforts to combat MS-13, the violent street gang with ties to Central America. Whoever wrote that must not be very familiar with MS-13 or other gangs like them. The idea that you'd want anyone to go easy on a bunch of killers like that speaks to a total isolation from the very real problem that many face in our country today. The police department released this statement shortly after the president's speech, more or less slapping him in the face for his efforts to show support to their boys in blue. Their statement read, As a department, we do not and will not tolerate roughing up of prisoners. The International Association of Chiefs of Police also piled on, though in a slightly less obvious manner. They basically just said that he doesn't have the training to know what he's talking about so everybody just do what you're told and don't listen to the president. The desk writers, the higher-ups, the paper pushers, they're all looking to climb a ladder, collect a bigger check and rub shoulders with the deep pockets. They don't like this plan at all because they know it's not good for the short-term optics. They know that the media has been able to change public opinion with one little snapshot, and suddenly a police force has a PR nightmare on their hands. So what do the boots on the ground think about the president's remarks? I'm glad you asked because they think it's a brilliant idea. And for the record, he's not talking about brutality, he's talking about not protecting murders from the natural bumps and bruises along the way. He's saying that maybe if the criminals were less sure they'd get kind and considerate treatment, maybe they'd feel less inclined to murder. I'm not sure what universe not allowing someone to bump their own head qualifies as brutality. And if you'll notice he didn't say to do anything aggressive, he said don't be too nice. In other words, you should treat good law-abiding citizens better than you treat lawbreakers in cuffs. Seems pretty self-explanatory to me, but apparently not everyone agrees with that. Here's how Mother Jones went off on the department after they had the gall to clap for and support our commander-in-chief. Such a reaction is, at the very least, unsettling given the allegations of discrimination against the department. The Dodge never publicized the findings of its investigation, but a 2011 letter from the Dodge to then Suffolk County Executive Steve Levy indicates that the police department was investigated for discriminatory policing against Latinos including an indifference toward immigrant residents that discouraged reporting crimes and cooperation with law enforcement, failing to thoroughly investigate hate crimes, 
and enforcing immigration policies in a way that encouraged racial profiling. A reform agreement reached between the Dodge and Suffolk County in 2013 required the department to institute a range of reforms. Specifically, the SCPD has been tasked with developing a bias-free policy that prohibits discrimination, including the denial of services based on race, and with revising its policy for the arrest of non-U.S. citizens and people with dual citizenship. The agreement also mandates additional anti-bias training, more outreach to Latinos, the hiring of more bilingual officers, and a biannual report to the Dodge about misconduct complaints against officers. The Justice Department launched its investigation into the SCPD in 2009, after the murder of 37-year-old Ecuadorian immigrant Marcelo Luchero. Luchero was stabbed to death by a member of a gang of teenagers who police officials later said target Latinos. Lawyers for Lucero's family sued Suffolk County officers, accusing them of failing to investigate the crime thoroughly. As part of the Dodge investigation that followed, Latino residents told officials about hate crimes they reported to local police that were not investigated, and that they felt immigrant bashing was permitted by the SCPD, according to the reform agreement. Once again, the left thinks they've got him. Trust me, if you got murdered, you wouldn't want anyone treating your murderer too kindly, and yet you'd think the world was ending. They're just sure that if they can make even one comment like this that horrifies them reach enough people, conservatives will finally turn on him. The problem with that is that we agree with him, and the more the publicize comments like this, the more we like him. Source, Mother Jones, share if you agree with the president's comments.